on this episode of Therapy Bites Our Lab. In your relationships, are you really listening or are you chomping at the bit just waiting your turn to speak? During difficult moments, do you uh, become a responder or a reactor, maybe even a nuclear one? Uh, Could you use a hand on the throttle of your reactor? Well, today's guest is going to take you spelunking inside the crevices of your own cortices and teach you to fill your mind with the moment, to be in the moment in the conversation. Join us as we journey into other dimensions, dimensions of consciousness, a mindful journey into understanding the psychology of reacting, responding, and relationships. Tune in and listen closely. This stuff could change your life. Stay tuned following the interview for On the Couch and Off the Rocker, our special guest's psychocilly analysis by Art Lab's own head cabbager, Dr. Ima Freudnot. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch, while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's he and the T-Ball team. Okay, T-Ballers, welcome to another great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab, where we pick apart all things psychology and take a bite out of many common myths. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about dimensions of consciousness, psychology of reacting, responding, and relationships with our very special guest and mindfulness coach and world-class podcaster himself, Alan Carroll. We're going to talk about the mechanics of being a responder versus a reactor, mindful speaking and salvaging relationships through that process. Is managing thoughts and emotions possible? How do you do that? And how can you become your own brain mechanic? Alan Carroll is an educational psychologist specializing in transpersonal psychology and founder of Alan Carroll and Associates. He's a world-class public speaker, a trainer, a coach, a corporate consultant, and since 1983, he and his team have delivered the Mindfulness in Action workshops in over 50 countries. Now, that's a lot of traveling. He's been featured on (laughs) ABC TV and appeared on some of the globe's top radio programs and podcasts. He's passionate about giving people the experience of mindfulness and presence through public speaking. Alan's daily yoga and meditation practices, which he learned at the Isha Foundation, and with uh, Sadhguru, and he's going to help me pronounce that better when he gets on the show today, uh, are another layer in the foundation that he's created to be grounded in non judgmental in the present moment, being non judgmental in the present moment. He's dedicated his life in search of tools that can be used uh, by everyone to escape the psychological suffering caused by our ego and reconnect to the vast transcendent spiritual dimension of consciousness. Imagine that. I did talk about spelunking. Uh, And this lies just on the other side of the thoughts we think. That ought to sound pretty familiar to your regular T-ball listeners because we talk about thoughts a lot and the power they have to program our lives. Stay in the stands at the end of the interview, T-Ballers, and witness our special guest slug a bite-sized brain ball with your name all over it, clean out of the art lab. Alan, thank you so much for being here today. It's just a pleasure to have you. Tell us, what what drew you in the first place to the, the whole area of mindfulness? And then we'd like to hear some about this, the Isha Foundation, hopefully I've pronounce that correctly isha Isha foundation isha 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 not isha but isha the isha Isha foundation Foundation. how do you pronounce uh said gurus what's the that's it Sadguru. Sadguru. okay well we want to hear about all that fill us in you asked the first question would be what was the attraction what was the thing that ignited the spark inside of me that sent me down a path which we will label mindfulness. And fortunately, it's in the DNA. I don't know. I was reading the yoga books when I was a teenager. I was doing meditation. I was doing transpersonal training. The one I I, I love, the, my very first love was Werner Earhart. 
with the S training, which is now the forum, the forum. Uh, and that, that was a, a, a mind shift of a training to, to begin to play with the thoughts that we think. And here I am 50 years later, and it all boils down to your ability to navigate through the thoughts that you think. And the problem of it is, is that you can't navigate through the thoughts that you think if you consider yourself to be the thought. So you have to be able to create a space of observation of the thought, and that's mindfulness. So mindfulness is creating that space in your consciousness to be able to observe the thoughts. And when you can observe the thoughts, you can play. That's amazing. I, I love how you put that. Creating a space. Yep. But I'm, I'm going to guess that it, I mean, it's been my experience. I don't have to guess. It, personally, I, I think sometimes a lot easier said than done. And then in my, I also find people that really get it wrong. And I've said on some other podcasts, and, and this really amazed me. It still amazes me to say this because I've been recommending, recommending mindfulness uh, for many, many years. I've had folks say, when, you know, when I try to do mindfulness, I actually get more anxious and it makes things worse. And it just seems like such a, a strange thing that that people can take something that is so healthy yep. and they say it makes them worse. Have you ever heard of that? I have. The way you describe it is a way of, of painting a picture in, in, in the mind of how you how you view it. And therefore that's your reality. If you can manage the thoughts, you can paint any picture you want. And so why wouldn't you paint a picture of God's being, divine energy here in the room right now, dancing with each other, having fun and enjoying each other's company? So no matter what they say, there's no resistance. So the question is, how can you reduce the resistance that you have to the incoming flow of the energy? The technique that we do in our trainings is the easiest way that I know to accomplish that friction-free environment in which you don't get all heated up by the thoughts being too close together. So when you create that space between the thoughts, you create, you aerate the soil in the wintertime, at, in the spring, you aerate the soil by creating holes in the soil. So you want to be able to aerate the thoughts that you think. But that's, that is a, there's a game that they play in Harry Potter, the, the wizards play. It's called Greenwich. And in Greenwich, there is a roles that people play. And one of the roles that Harry played, do you know what role Harry played? I don't, I'm not really sure. What role was that? He played the seeker. Oh, of course. Yes, yes, the seeker. The seeker. Interesting mm -hmm. name, the seeker. Now, what is the seeker's role? Do you remember the seeker's job was to get the what? Well, to get the flying ball through the air, but I don't That's recall right. the name of that thing. Right. It's called the Golden Snitch. Uh, of course. And it darted and dashed and moved and, 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 and changed all over. It was like slippery like an eel. And those are what thoughts are like. So to catch a thought is a pretty good step one of transformation. Can you catch the thought that you're thinking? And that is, that's a challenge. But, but the easiest thought to catch, which everybody can do, forget the trying to catch the thought that you're thinking. Lord God, bless be with us. Catch the thought that you're speaking. Oh, catch and the thought you're speaking. Thought that you're speaking. Then you're at the effect of the automatic conditioned ego which uses the speaking process in order to manifest his, its intention, which is, which is a survival of its identity, or her identity, his identity. But if you can control, create a space between this thought that you're speaking and this thought that you're speaking, you are able to create time. And in time, you can command the instrument, which is painting the picture, to paint a different picture, to take a breath, to pause, 
to ground the energy which is igniting the thoughts and be able to channel those thoughts and be able to control the number one skill, which is the ability to control the timing of the ego's speaking. You are now, you have now tamed the ego's tongue. And wow. now the ego's tongue works for you. The ego's tongue. I, I've, I've been in this business 38 years. I've never heard that term. The ego's tongue. You guys, if you, I, I hope that you go back and replay. If you don't listen to anything else but this section of the episode, you should replay that. You should make yourself a mixtape and replay what Alan just said there because that is absolute psychological gold. Uh, uh, gold is in the shiny stuff. Uh, the ego's tongue. You know, when you're talking about that, I'm reminded of a couple of guys. Uh, one of them is is right here. I'll go to back to my other cam so we can see it. One of them is right here, and this is Soren Kierkegaard, uh, a uh, existentialist philosopher, and he talked about stimulus and response and focused a lot on the space that we have between a stimulus and then our response to it. And what I find in my work with folks is it's, you know, speaking is almost like walking in that after you've done it for a long time, it, it gets put on autopilot. And for those of you listening, you've heard me use this term, but the term is implicit processing, meaning processing below the level of your conscious awareness. And if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, once we get it up, you'll see my hand is off the screen. It's on the screen now, but, uh, in the screen, this is what you're consciously aware of, but that view is pretty limited. Everything else happens off stage, even off stage to to me, to Alan, to you guys. But if you do what Alan's talking about and create a space between the stimulus and response, then you can become mindful of, well, the word you're speaking in the moment. And you know, Alan, what I find is that people really would just walk and talk and walk and talk, and they're no more mindful of the words they say than putting left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. They don't, I mean, it's why people step in holes and break legs and fall over. They're not mindful of their walking. And this is why there's so many broken relationships. In the relationship, people aren't aware of where they're walking through that relationship. The second guy that comes to mind that I talk a lot about is Viktor Frankl, that he would break apart the word responsibility and say responsibility is your ability to respond. But to do that, I think that you have to create this space you're talking about. Uh, what do you think gets in the way of that for most people, though? What gets, to, what gets in the way is the lack of discipline uh, because you have to practice mindfulness. It's not something that, okay, doc, you're now mindful, boom. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, mindfulness is, uh, for, for example, when you dream at night. Most people dream at night. They wake up the next morning and they remember that they were dreaming. And then during the day, those dreams, thoughts fade away. Well, there's a second type of dreaming called lucid dreaming, where you actually wake up in the dream and know that you're dreaming. Uh, and so the same is for the way we speak. Uh, the way we speak, we, we, we're, we're in a dream state because all the thoughts are all linked together. The thoughts that, that you wake up in the morning, go through the day, one continuous stream of thinking thoughts, about 80,000 thoughts, Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle were talking about, pass through your consciousness every day. And it's a continuous stream. And so what you want to be able to do is to reach that state, which the folks in India call mukti. It's there's a space on the other side of those thoughts. So you have to be able to disrupt that that stream of thinking consciously and make those thoughts disappear. And so that is, that's, that's, that's a slippery, that's the slippery eel, but you can consciously disrupt the thoughts that you are speaking. But unfortunately you're speaking for the ego and the ego is designed for preservation. 
It's not designed to surrender, to, to surrender and commit suicide here. Uh, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to give up my thought that I'm going to put into this space right now because that's me and that's what I want to say right now. But then there has to be the being. The being is the space in which the ego lives. And the being says, hey, it's okay. You can, you can be the ego. You can have fun. All I want you to do is breathe once in a while. Ah. You take a breath once in a while. And in order to do that, you have to have a thought inside your head to take a breath and relax your body, which breaks and disrupts the mental stream, which frees you from the grip. And that's the practice. And you got to practice that technique. And that's why meditation is so important. Because meditation is the practicing of the technique with the thoughts that we think and mindful spaces speaking, which is what we teach, disrupts the thoughts that you speak. And when you do that, you control the timing of your, of your destiny. Because now I can choose, Doc, what vibration do I want to vibrate? Like music. Some music makes the flowers grow. Love, compassion, togetherness. And some music makes the flowers die. And when you can control the instrument which vibrates the air, then you can control the beauty and the love and the joy and the compassion of the environment in which you live. And that is in your hands. And it's free. Wow. Air, space is free. It's the fifth element, Doc. It's the earth, air, fire, water, and space. It's the mother element that you're using to stick in that space between this sound and this sound. And you're no longer automatic transmission. You're now manual transmission. Now, I want to, I want to drive down the love road. I want to drive down the compassion road. How do you do that? <laughs> well, you got you to gotta learn how to forgive. You have to learn how to forgive. Christians would talk about you have to learn how to forgive your sins, which means I have to love you because if you sinned against me, I, I, have, a, I, have, I, have, I have no love there. But I have to forgive the sin that I think that I've created in my mind about you. And, and that happens when you create a space because you're no longer stuck by the thought that I have grievances. You're now, you're now I, I call it, I, I call it space oil. Oh, my goodness. Alan's holding up a oil can on which he has written space oil. <laughs> and we put it between the thoughts that you're thinking. But we can't do that. It's a little slippery. But I can put it between the thoughts that I am speaking. Now, I'm going to describe that, this to our listeners because Alan's holding up two balls, and those balls represent thoughts. Yep. And you're putting space oil out of a literal oil can. And you know what? I love this stuff because you guys could actually go to your local hardware store and get an oil can, write space oil on it, and the next time you're going to have a difficult conversation, take your own oil can, your own space oil can, as a reminder to put some space. That is genius. I love that. And and the balls are thoughts. You know, I, I say to... A lot of uh, our folks in the art lab, which stands for accurate, realistic thinking and life affirming beliefs, that we, we, uh, our, our brains create thoughts the way blizzards create snowflakes. And I, I love what you said earlier because it really is hard to reach out and pluck one of those and examine it and decide what does this thought mean in this space of communicating with this person that I claim to love and care for so much, what thoughts are driving my part of this communication process? And I think that that really does need to be brought from the implicit level of automatic behavior that was pre-programmed years, if not decades ago. Uh, You know, some of us learn how to communicate with someone we're going to spend the rest of our life with. I, I, my wife and I have been together for, uh, it'll be 40 years uh, this summer. Uh, but even I am often not very mindful of the words I'm saying because, as I said earlier, they become as automatic 
is ambulation or walking left foot, right foot, left foot, uh, right foot. And it needs to be made more explicit, increasing our awareness of that with Alan's magical sp- <laughs> space oil. Where did you come up with that? Is that just some epiphany you had? Or, or? You're right. All my life, I'm into the same conversation. And so part of the conversation is, how can you explain something as slippery as an abstraction of metaphysical mumbo jumbo into a way that the person can understand that abstraction in a more concrete way? And when you start using physical objects to explain the thoughts that you're thinking, you, you, you build the pillar of clarity in articulation. And most people are not present enough to realize the value of using, using techniques, because that means that I really don't want you to really understand what I'm saying. If I really wanted you to understand what, what I'm saying, I would, I, would, I would present it in a way that is more memorable. So, for example, this is a demonstration I'll do. When people experience resistance, upset, irritation, angry, they get they get stirred up. I get all stirred up. I get stirred up and get angry and upset. So now and, and Alan is shaking a water bottle there, guys, and you can see this on the video when it's up. But he's shaking the water bottle to dis- to demonstrate getting all stirred up during a conversation. And you see, oh, there's glitter. There's glitter in the water bottle. And there's glitter. That's all your thoughts and anger get all stirred up. But when you practice pausing, all of a sudden... Oh, they're floating to the bottom, and the water bottle is becoming crystal clear. And that's called mindfulness. Being in that state of crystal clarity. So the question is, how do you stop the getting of the stirred up? And so you have to practice the disruption of the automaticity of your speaking. Because your speaking is, everybody has a different pattern. And if I can disrupt the pattern, then I then I disrupt the conditioning, which is the way I would normally respond. And then I can go from the disembodied state, which is when you're caught by the thought storms, into an embodied state, which is when you're caught by the by by your body. And so then you begin to take a look at what your body is doing, not what your mind is doing, what your body is doing. And your body becomes, oh, I'm a little tense. Oh, I'm, and so I might want to get grounded. I'm not breathing. Take more of a breath. So my focus is on the inside, and so I cut the the, the connection or my attention to the to the thoughts. And and it, that, that's an important thing to understand because the thoughts create ninety five percent of the issues in your physical body. Uh, and if you can control the thoughts from from being the victimized thoughts and the angry thoughts and the upset thoughts. And I'm going to hold grievances all my life about what they did to me and all those things that they, I'm going to hold those grievances and holding on to grievances is like swimming through the space with cannonballs, holding on to cannonballs through, through the sea of space. It, you will, you will drown your physical body. Your body doesn't want that. Your ego does because I want to hold on to those grievances, but your body doesn't want that. Why, why is that? Why do you think we want to hold on to those grievances, Alan? What's what's the upside to doing that? What's the downside for the ego? Is the question. Oh, okay. So, so what? So what's the downside? It's it's easier to understand going from the why. Why would you hold on to a grievances? What what who, what's holding on to the grievances is the ego. So if I can let go of those grievances, the ego says, "Wait a minute, I got to give up something here." I got to give ah. up my anger, my upset, my irritation, my, my what you did to what your parents did, what that country did. I have to give that up as my identity in order to in order to to forgive you. No. <laughs> and so there are reasons why people don't do that. You know, I'll, I tell my new clinicians uh, and, and I, I train clinicians and I tell them uh, as clinicians, we really need to be aware what we're asking people to give up to be healthy. Uh, we yeah. often think it's a no-brainer. Hey, I'm the the ivory tower guru clinician, whoever, whatever, grand poobah. All you got to do or, or is use these techniques. But what we often forget is you're right. Uh, the the person has to give up a lot just to be healthy. And for some, they think 
that that's too high a price to pay. And, and your psyche is going to try to convince you that yep. giving that up is a threat to you. I have a video up on YouTube. You guys can go take a look at it. It's it's labeled as a Father's Day video, and I intended it as a lesson for folks to heal their relationship with their father, whether their father is living or not living. And that is entirely possible. You can watch the video. But the point there is that there's actually, and, and, and Alan, you can weigh in on this, um, uh, some mechanics to forgiveness. And one of those is to take that space, which we can henceforth call uh, CSO, Carol's Space Oil, and uh, you can take some Carol's uh, uh, Space Oil, or maybe it's CMOS, Carol's Magical, or I'll have to come up with an acronym for that. I magical love that. Magical is pretty good. That's, I like the magical piece. It's yeah, yeah, the all, magical, all Carol's Magical Space Oil, and um, uh, realize that the person that you need to forgive is no longer a threat to you because I find that the reason people don't forgive is they still think that somebody that did something to them, abuse or whatever, 20, 30 years ago, still lives in their mind as a threat to them. But but maybe they're not. The second thing that I encourage people to understand is that forgiveness is not the absence of a difficult emotion. Uh, I'm not saying to be happy or or not the presence of a preferred one. I'm not saying be happy that somebody abused you. That'd be ridiculous. But realize they're no longer a threat and realize you can experience any emotion you want, but you'll experience less of the difficult ones if you realize this person is not a threat to you. Go watch the video. It's on YouTube, guys. Uh, it's uh, under on, on the, the YouTube channel under videos. It's one about Father's Day. But it applies to mothers and daughters and siblings and co-workers and neighbors and just other human beings on the planet. Uh, use Alan's uh, space oil to give yourself space to to think about this. And the other thing, back to the water bottle, that, that was fantastic. I find that's a huge problem in communication, too, is that people do. They get so shook up that there's just that blizzard of snowflake thoughts flying everywhere and they try to tackle well I got to tackle this one you know you you burned the bread and 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 you didn't give me what I wanted and and you said a you called me a doo doo head and and there's this slight and this wrong and this slight and they really can't my dad would say uh, or my dad used to say they'll get their tongues wrapped around their eye teeth and they can't see a word they're saying and they're just unaware that's of it. Very clever. I like that. that, that, that uh, Thank my dad, a carpenter, Robert Meeks. I may see him every day. I'm going to write it down so I don't want to forget. Yeah. So, yeah. Be again. careful not to get your tongue wrapped around your IT so that you can't see a word you're saying. And that's what happens in arguments. And I find that if you can, can engineer a reminder to do something as simple as breathing, uh, Earlier, Alan said that, and you know what I did, guys? I took a deep breath. I actually was sitting here listening, and I'm excited about what Alan's saying. And and when you get excited or when you get angry, if you'll notice, you actually breathe more shallow. Therefore, if you can engineer a reminder, and I want to thank Alan for that, I immediately took a deep breath. It was so cleansing, and I thank Alan for that. You know, you can give the other person in the conversation permission to remind you to breathe. Imagine that, giving a spouse or even uh, a kid or a coworker or an employee, you could put a sign on your desk instead of your name, Grand Pooh by so-and-so, head of the universe, Put a sign that says, uh, a little placard, remind me to breathe. Remind me to breathe. One of the most simple things that that people seem to forget, if if you'll catch yourself, you'll spend a great part of the day. I mean, this is just my experience. Alan has more experience with the mindfulness than I do. Do you notice that people just go through life taking half breaths? If you want to have a discipline which builds 
your mindfulness muscles. Breathing is the key element that's under your control. Because in order to take a deep breath, you have to have a thought inside your head to wake up and out and take a deep breath. Otherwise, the breathing is only 500 millimeters of, you know, of liters. It's like half, half, half a liter in, half a liter out, half a liter in, half a liter out. And but if I tell myself, gee, Alan, and this time I want to I want to take a deeper breath. Well, there's actually another whole liter and a half. I can get almost a 300 percent more of the prana energy in my body if I can tell my body to take a deeper breath. But unless you can get what I call it a, a command override switch. Which <laughs> Alan's holding up a go sign, a go light. Oh, it's a stop sign too. There's two sides oh, well, to it. It's a, so so, what, so what, what you have is when I, when, so you're trying to figure out a way, how can I become mindful? Well, if I can control the, 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 the speaking, if I can control, I'm talking right now, and now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna control the talking right now, and now I'm gonna. And the stoplight just came on. So I, I can control the on and the off switch. Now in the, in the Buddhist tradition of the, of the Tao, uh, the on is going to be the yang energy. That's the forward thrusting of the energy, the, the masculine energy. And now, now we have the yin energy. The yin energy is the feminine energy. And the yin energy occurs when you can stop the yang energy. So that's when you pause and take in that breath. And what it does, the, the, the yang energy creates the heat. And the yin energy creates the cooling of the heat. And so when you're speaking with the fire of the dragon, which is what you are firing and igniting your thoughts and setting them out across the space, uh, you, you want to be able to cool the engine while the engine's running, which means you have to figure out a way. How do, how do we cool the engine when the ego speaks? And so, thank God, we have something called air cooled. Uh, because <laughs> when we breathe in, we have to take that breath, which disrupts the, the, the ego's thought. And that begins to to have the ego under your control because I've tamed the tongue. If I tame the tongue, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with taming the thoughts. That's amazing that we as humans are actually engineered with a built-in air-cooled system called breathing. What a genius thought that is. You guys, I hope you're writing this stuff down. And, you know, some of that sounds a lot like uh, Yogi Bear. Yogi Bear said, um, and, and what's, what's the breathing in call? That is the... The uh, feminine, uh, is that the yin or the yang? The, the breathing in is the yin energy, which is the feminine energy. And the breathing out, see, when I breathe out, you, if you hold your hand up to your mouth right now and go, ha, 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 ha. That's hot. That's hot air. So that, that's heat. That heat is being generated within your own body. That's why you want to be conscious of anger. Because anger is the fire that you're generating in your body that you're going to throw out of the dragon's mouth to attack that which has attacked you. But the damage done to your body is, is, is not worth the price to, to, of the satisfaction the ego gets by firing and attacking because it destroys chemically my, my physical body. And so the holding on to the grievances that is that when most people hold on to grievances, they are not able to forgive that which is outside of them, that which did it to them. But if you shift your attention and say, all right, yeah, that's true, but what is it costing me? For full show notes and transcript of today's episode, go to therapybites.podbean.com. Welcome to Social Media Smackdown. Tonight, the irresistible force meets the illogical object. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to read the Hey, T-Ballers. Doc Keith here with another episode of social media smackdown on a post that I discovered on Medium that just, I guess, lets anybody write articles. 
and it's entitled The Keys to Surviving in a Toxic Office, published January the 15th, 2023. And the writer starts out saying, I'm a lover, not a fighter, so when it comes to sticking up for myself and battling against bullies, I've lost every single time. And yet, she gets into this thing of bullying itself, which is labeling others and labeling a work environment. Listen, sorry, but this word toxic is just another low-hanging clickbait term. If an office was toxic, the local authorities would close it down. You'd have to call OSHA, and fines would be levied. Toxic is just another term to name call, to blame, to defer responsibility, and sacrifice one's own power. Consider this. If an office was toxic, then why are there still current employees? Why can there? What about the future employees? It's an unhealthy and unhelpful term that solves no problems and just labels and belittles others. What if the other employees call this writer toxic? Uh, stalemate. Where do you go from there? It's just an exchange of name calling. Better to uh, the better approach is theory why management. Instead of focusing on the person as a problem, look at the situation, join together. Habit number five, everybody, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, Highly Effective People. Setting boundaries, effective communication, but these are hard. It's easier to just blame and name call using low-hanging clickbait terms like toxic and gaslighting. There's a book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, and it's just an old, tired refrain. Give posts like this that try to label workplaces and label people the old one-two punch. Doc Heath out. What a slobber knocker. The winner by Psychological Smackdown, Doc Heath. No pronouns were harmed during the production of this podcast. You're listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball Tea. The best advice on the net. No copay required. Welcome to the Therapy Bites Art Lab Library, where we have poured over thousands of volumes to bring you the latest Couch Crumbs quote. Oh, would you like a napkin? You're getting crumbs in the book. That okay? We eat book. Oh. Oh, mom, 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 mom. oh, now today's Couch Crumbs Quote. Well, good evening there. Thank you for joining us. Those who desire healthier lives must first focus on designing healthier thoughts. A Couch Crumb Quote by Doc Heath. It's elementary. Oh, you got crumbs on the couch. Extra points for you. Show your T-Ball team spirit and buy your hard-working Art Lab team a cup of coffee, which helps fuel purchases of high-octane equipment and T-Ball tech that get poured back into percolating, highly caffeinated content for you. Just go to buymeacoffee.com and search Therapy Bites. Here's he. And the T-Ball team. What is it costing my body? What's it costing my mental health, my emotional well-being, my physical body, my spiritual? What's it costing me to hold on to the cannonball in the in the middle of the ocean? Wait a minute. I don't want to do that anymore. And, and so you have to begin to lubricate your consciousness. And the way you lubricate your consciousness is you lubricate the thoughts that you are speaking. And, and to do that is we do an exercise where we have people speak really, really fast, have people speak at a normal rate. Right now, it's about a 200 word per minute right now. But then we want them to go to the extreme. Very slow. Let's bring it down to 25, 30 words per minute. So that's an exercise that our audience here can do once a day for a minute. See if you can slow down. Say any sounds that you want. But 
put the sounds like they are are bubbles of sounds in a sea of stillness. And in the stillness, you take that breath, get fully relaxed, and then blow a few more bubbles of sound. And go so slow that you got 25 sounds in a minute. And what you're doing is you are creating spaciousness. Consciously, you're creating spaciousness. And every time you create spaciousness, you you go from a dream state, which is the ego, to a mindfulness state, which is the being. And in dream work, we call it lucid dreaming. You wake up in the you wake up and realize, hey, I'm no longer the victim of the thoughts that I think. I'm the master of the thoughts that I think. <laughs> wow. And I see so many people, you're exactly right. They are actually just victims of the thoughts that they think. And I love that practice exercise. I will definitely try that myself, and I recommend it out to all our listeners today. What, what's, a, what's a good way to keep track of that, the, the words per minute? Just look at a clock? What, what, I, what I did was I took my stopwatch on my iPhone, and I have 27, I have 24 sounds, right? Oh, fantastic. And this what really is going to be a, pod, a podcast like episode for, so a, right now, for video. It's, it's something like that. Oh, that's awesome. And oh, so you actually have pre-programmed what you're saying, and I'm going to read this. Uh, Alan has it timed, and you'll have to watch the video to get the full benefit of this. But I am a professional speaker. Why? Because I speak. When I want to speak, and I and I'm pausing. I, I'm not stuttering. I'm pausing because on Alan's screen here he has a zero, which is the pause. And I pause. Stop when pause. I want to pause. Stop, and then another pause. And how many words is that? Twenty six. How many words is that? Oh, it's twenty two. Oh, twenty two words. So you guys can twenty two words. And so, well, what, Alan, what do you think? I, I mean, I'm having all sorts sorts of ideas here. What would you think? Uh, and and challenge me if if you don't think there's value in this. But uh, I'm I'm coming up with a experiment in my mind now to recommend to listeners that they would, uh, if you have something a disagreement. If you have something important to say to a loved one, uh, maybe write it out on a piece of paper and keep it at 22 words. You know, sometimes less is more. Keep it at 22 words. Put pauses in it and practice it a few times before you go have the conversation. Actually program in slowing down your speech rate so that there's more in breath, more yin, more um, air cooling while you're speaking it. Because uh, a, a heavy in principle, I'm sure Alan's familiar with, uh, that comes, I think this comes from the Douglas, which is part of um, a, uh, a world-renowned center of neuroscience where a colleague of mine used to work up in Canada. Um, in the brain, what fires together wires together and if you will fire together that is practice a difficult bit of communication along with breathing during communicating that information then that in breath will be wired together with the speaking of that information and you'll have so much more productive conversations now this is one of those free things Actually, it's not for you. can send us a nickel every time you use it. Uh, that way, we don't got to get the attorneys involved. No, I'm just joking about that. You, this is yours free to use. Try to engineer into your difficult conversations these breaths. And, I, goodness, I, I just think the neuroscience that I know anyway is just clear, and I won't go into it, uh, of how successful that will be if we'll all just do it. But there's a practice effect. And that's one of the things that I see stumble people up. I, I, I see people that I will train in some mindfulness techniques uh, that are, you know, they're, they're very simple. 
Uh, one is a three-minute breathing space. I do a, uh, I call it a mindful raisin exercise. It can also be a mindful chocolate morsel exercise where you mindfully eat a raisin and you bring your attention to all the sensory aspects of, of eating that raisin. And instead of just gobbling it down, most people don't even taste the food they eat. They're just worried about cramming it down their throat. You can practice mindfulness while you're eating. I practice mindfulness when I'm making my morning black maca, turmeric, black pepper extract, seven sacred mushroom latte. <laughs> Say that five times real fast. You can practice right. mindfulness doing anything, can't you, Alan? You can practice mindfulness doing anything. And the problem of it is, is you have to have the thought that I'm going to do something for mindfulness. And the difficulty there is that we are seduced by the thoughts that we think. Um, And until you can create a space, then you're still seduced by the thoughts that you think. Because people get caught up by the content of the thought. I'm not talking about content of the thought. I'm talking about the management of the energy that the thought represents. The thought's just a form of energy that that sparks and then disappears, sparks and disappears, sparks and disappears. It it spikes, it spikes, it spikes. So you want to be able to create that space to cool the spike. And the more you create that space, you go from the ripples on the sea to the sea itself. And one of the jokes is there's two waves on the ocean and they meet. And they look at each other and say, wow, how you doing? Great. How are you doing? Great. How are how, how you doing? I'm trying to find the ocean. And I'm, well, I know it's around here somewhere. <laughs> and and then, they, then they go and laugh and they go away. And so the wave needs to melt. So the ego needs to disintegrate in order for it to be absorbed again by the ocean. And the ego is not in the disintegration business. The being is in the disintegration business as soon as possible. So what what do you mean disintegrate? How do you disintegrate it? It's easy. It's the easiest mindfulness technique you could possibly do. You just stick a space, a pause, a half a second, quarter of a second, an eighth of a second, three seconds. Stick it between the sounds that you speak. And you will shift from an egoic center of identity to the being center of identity. And you no longer take things personally. (laughs) So you don't get reactive. You no longer react to things anymore. Because you're now the ocean looking at these little fish and the fish no longer are going to seduce you to follow them in ways that damage your physical body. So love, compassion, joy, forgiveness bring happiness to joy to the physical body. So obviously, logically, that's where where you want to go. And and we really are, I think, as a culture engineered to take things personally because we think that everything's a threat to us. We think that what our kid says to us is a threat to us, what our spouse says to us, what our neighbor or boss is a threat to us. And I think that that's a wonderful technique for diffusing that thought process, adding that space of the breath, because really what is going on when someone says something to you is is Marcus Aurelius would refer to it as just sound waves. I added the sound waves thing, but sound waves riding upon air set in motion. Now, it's really windy outside today, but I could stand in that wind and it is not a threat to me. It's not a tornado. It's not a hurricane. It's not a threat to me. Uh, I have to engineer my thinking in the moment by being aware of my thinking and reminding myself that what Alan's saying or what you're saying or what even my son is saying, my wife is saying, 
is not a threat to me because every time I decide that it's a threat to me, I'm going to respond with the dragon breath. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have halitosis, bad breath. That's just a lot of hot air. But I'm going to respond that way only because I've engineered my mind to think that. And I, I just love how Alan's putting this. And I know I've said this, but please write this stuff down and go back and replay this episode. Alan, how does that play into directly connect to being how we started out, a responder versus a reactor? I have a, as you have a practice in which you are creating stillness between the agitation of the air, which you do when you push air out, you create agitation, you create that stillness. And in the stillness, you'll notice that the the light that you have to shine upon whatever the issue is that you're looking at gets brighter. And the light allows you to see things more clearly. And the clearer you are, the better will be your judgments, your choices that, that you make about the events that are in front of you. So the light of consciousness is created by consciously using the fifth element of space, sticking it between the physical things or the energy spikes, and creating the yin energy in the midst of the the yang energy, which creates mental equilibrium. And when you get to the mental equilibrium, then everything is still. And everything, things, what is doesn't have any meaning anymore. Everything just is. It's it's already is. You don't get to vote on the way it is. It already is. (laughs) And so the ego wants to vote. Good, bad, right, wrong. You don't get to vote. But but the problem of it is, is that you realize what you vote with are your thoughts. And if you can begin to disintegrate the thoughts by disintegrating the thoughts that you speak, it allows you to more clearly see and therefore become more grounded and stable and, 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 and walk through life with more of a compassion in your heart for your for, for the earth and for our fellow for our fellow beings. Uh, because you've you're no longer so busy defending what you've what you've identified yourself to be, which is which is just uh, I, I love talking with you, Doc, because you're <laughs> it. This, we, we live in a our ego is like a Gordian knot. Oh, and he's holding um, up a. I, I'm I'm almost uh, uh, some. My wife says I'm colorblind, but that looks pretty orange to me. It's a big orange ball of yarn, and it represents your ego. And the ego is all the thoughts that you think, all the thoughts that you think, all the memories that you have, uh, all the I am your identity. I am this. I am this. I am this. I am this. That's your identity. It's all your thoughts. And it's all it's all held together. And what unfortunately, when something is all held together, it's called constipation. (laughs) And so so what we're doing is we're trying to find how do we unconstipate this this, uh, ego? How do we disintegrate the ego? Alexander the Great, he did it with a sword. He went down to the Gordian knot and he he took the sword and he cut the Gordian knot. He unraveled it and and he became the leader of Asia. Well, and, well, and I want to give just a, a bit of backstory so that it makes more sense. The Gordian knot had famously famously been the Gordian knot for millennia, uh, or so it's said. And and the the struggle people would come and try to untie the darn thing. And they would get very, very frustrated because no one could untie it. And then Alexander the Great shows up with one swift stroke of the sword, unties it with one cut. And what would you say that cut is psychologically for us with untangling that? Is that the space? Well, what we what we use, uh, going back to the flashlight analogy, is we use what's called is a lightsaber <laughs> from the Star Trek from the from the uh, space odyssey movies uh it's a, it's a lightsaber so we we are using the lightsaber of the jedi by shining a light on this well how do we shine the light on this we dissolve a piece of the ego how do we dissolve a piece of the ego we pause between the sounds that the ego speaks and every time you dissolve a piece of the ego what you create is a space of nothingness uh, it's like I use the analogy of you have a storm door in the winter 
and you have a screen door in the summer. So the storm door in the winter resists everything and it's suffering, life is suffering. Screen door allows everything to come through, in and out, a nice flow. What's the difference between the two doors? One has holes and one doesn't. So you can transform your consciousness. You can reduce your psychological suffering by not letting go of of, of your attachments to your thoughts, simply begin to practice putting holes in the screen in the door. Just begin to practice pausing, and that will unravel the Gordian knot, because we're using this we're using space, pausing, to disintegrate the the thoughts, it reduces constipation. It's very healthy. I don't know. I love I that. Uh, the the thought that the biggest problem in our relationships may be our own constipated mindset yep. and the laxative is the space yep. in the screen door that Alan is talking about creating. And best of all, it is free, free, free. Now I guess it depends on yep. what you mean by free because it, it does take some effort. It does take some attention, does take some work. It's, it's not a miracle drug. It's not a pill in an amber-colored pill bottle. You can't go get a script for this from your local physician. Uh, this is something that you, uh, as I kind of tongue-in-cheek say, has, has three major components. There's three things you have to do, folks, uh, to, to master this. And the first thing is practice. The most important thing is practice. The second most important thing is... Um, some of you know what it is already. Oh, it's practice. And, and oh, yeah, the third thing is, you guessed it, more practice. And, and that's what I find people that come to me, and they, they'll say this. They'll say, well, you know what? I tried that mindfulness crap, and I sat there, and my thoughts went all over the place. And I got so frustrated, I was doing it wrong. Well, but, but, but that's not doing it wrong. Uh, you're, you're not there to change the thoughts, you're not there to change anything. You're just there to be there, or at least that's what I teach people. You're there to notice. That's it. If you're sitting there and your intent is to focus on your breathing, and that's how I start people out, let's, let's focus on our breathing, uh, then, then do that. But what's going to happen inevitably is you're going to think about the toaster oven and how maybe... You threw it at your wife the other night. Now, you shouldn't do that. That's illegal, throwing toaster ovens at people. Uh, and then you're going to think about, I need to uh, get a new roof. And, oh, I've got that work project. And, oh, I've got to mow the lawn or trim the verge or whatever or clip my fingernails, uh, which is what I did right before this podcast, by the way. I've got nicely, newly manicured nails, and I did that myself. But you're going to think about all these things. But guess what? That's okay. You, you're just aware, and you can see this on camera if you're watching it, but I'm using my fingers, that I'm trying to focus on the breath, and then, oh, uh, there's the toaster of it. Well, that's okay. I bring my awareness that I've now thinking of the toaster of it. It's okay. I'm going to bring my awareness back to my breath. And, oh, squirrel. If you've seen the movie Up, uh, Squirrel, with one of my favorite actors, Ed Asner. Um uh, that's okay. Your awareness is going to the squirrel. Just bring your focus back on your breath. And I don't know if I created this or stole it. I lose track. As they say, the art of originality is concealing your sources. But I'll teach people that uh, it may have come from Thich Nhat Hanh, or, or at least part of it. My brain is the train. My breath is the track. My breath keeps my brain on track. My brain is the train. My breath is the track. My breath keeps my brain on track. You can create your own mantra. Uh, that's just one that I use. And the point is not changing anything, just being aware, uh, not even trying to stop changing anything, but just to be aware of where you are in the moment. That, that's what I teach people. I mean, it's very, very simple. Uh, but uh, that's where we start out. couple of thoughts. The meditation that I learned at the Isha Foundation, which they have their headquarters in the U.S. and Tennessee, they said when you're doing your meditation, mindfulness, 
presence, create an environment which minimizes distractions. Quiet as possibly can get. So there's no external agitation, if possible. But the one I like the best, which always helps me, and the other ingredient to a successful meditation is no expectations. You see, if you if you go into the meditation with the thought that whatever happens, squirrels, whatever, and you have no expectations, then there's no disappointment. There's no judging. You you can't go, oh, it wasn't good. It wasn't bad. I had a squirrel. <laughs> hey, no expectations. This is the squirrel's part of, part of the movie. Uh, and that allows you to to keep the to, to keep the to keep this clear. Keep and, all and the little you, sparkles at the bottom. And when I get stirred up, I sparkles am go conscious, everywhere. And I'm now conscious of being stirred up, and I know that I'm not going to be very effective until I get the stirring up calmed down, cool the engine. That Mm. got stirred up. And most people, unfortunately, react when they're stirred up. And you want to respond when you're grounded, mental equilibrium. And But you need to practice that state of consciousness because it's not something that is natural. Because the ego wants to speak and fill and tell you what's so about everything. I'll tell you everything there is. Everything that I see in my movie movie has meaning. I'll tell you the meaning of it, blah, 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 blah. But the meaning is painted with words and thoughts. And as you begin to practice managing the thoughts, which in India they they call Raja Yoga. Raja is king, king yoga. Ah. It's the yoga of thought. And what we're talking about is a form of Raja Yoga, which would be we're going to manage the thoughts that I speak. Wow. Whatever, whatever thought it is. Bingo. Ba. Te tu. Pe tu. Suyate. Bata. Do. Kilande. And so we do exercises like that, and people think I'm actually speaking in a foreign language. But you're just present in the moment. You are, you have, you have one foot into stillness which is the calmness and you have the other foot in the agitation of the ego and you're speaking for the ego, but you're also calm. And so you're stable as you swim, as you, as you swim through the space, you the vehicle that you have is, 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 is balanced. You have the, had the fire and the cool, the fire and the cool, the breathing in cools the engine, the firing out of the speaking, Just keep it still, keep it still. So you have to practice every day. Start out with a minute of stillness, wherever that may be. Just see if you can physically still your body. Sit in a chair, close your eyes. Close your eyes is important because a lot of the agitation is caused by what what you see. Close your eyes and a lot of the agitation goes away. This is called the stop technique. Stop technique is to S, just wake up and stop. Realize you're thinking about something. I caught a thought. I'm thinking about something. Okay, good. I'm going to stop. I'm going to become still. I'm going to take three breaths. Full breaths through the nose. Push the belly out. And as I breathe out, I'm going to observe. The, the stop, the T is to take the three breaths. The O is to observe any tension. Let the tension flow out when you, when you, on the out breath. Through the soles of your feet. One more breath. Let the energy flow out and it reduce any tension through the soles of your feet. Takes about 30 seconds. Open your eyes and proceed with kindness. May love and blessings be with us today. So do a an act of kindness. Takes about 30 seconds. Uh, and if you can do that, it's free. Doesn't cost any money. It's free. You can do it to stop technique for 30 seconds. Uh, and what you do is that you've anchored your energy in a moment of now in the stream. You're, you're anchored. And when you become anchored, you become more present to the moment. And what's really fun is whatever thought that you were thinking at the beginning of the exercise, it's evaporated. 
It's no longer there. You don't remember what it was. So you made a thought disappear and you broke the chain and you caught this golden snitch. And that's fun. Oh my, that is incredible. That, that I, I've never heard it put more succinctly. And we're, we're going to make some uh, video blurbs of the episode and pop that up on our YouTube channel just, just to benefit you guys from all these uh, Thank well, you. golden snitches that Alan's dropping today. And if you haven't seen it uh, uh, yet, go back and replay the video, guys, because over his left shoulder is actually a can of thought paint. And I want you guys to realize, as he uh, alluded to earlier, we're all painting our lives with our own special made-up, mixed-up, Sherwin-Williams quality of paint. Be very careful the consistency, coloring, and brush strokes that you use to paint your own life. And he's holding up a, a piece of uh, paper and a paintbrush and you get to decide the paintbrush. I, I decide it for my life. Alan decides it for his life. That's right. That's right. You get to choose. But as I tell people, uh, I, I'm a big free will guy. I, I think you live how you want to live. But uh, the results are yours. Whatever decision you make as far as brush and paint, well, that's that's going to uh, be the coloring of your life. Uh, make good paint choices. Alan, this has been such a, a, a just a blast. I could just sit there here and do this all day. But a couple of questions before we let you go: what What would you? And I, I hate to ask this because I don't know if if I could pick just one. But what would you say is your most favorite top communication hack? Something that you would just the biggest thing you'd recommend to people. T-ballers, time to quit your lollygagging. Get out of the dugout, onto the field, and live the art life. The, the top technique is to have one thought one time a day. If you can do it, write it down and, and just have the thought that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause, I'm going to take a breath, and I'm going to relax my body consciously one time, sometime between the time I wake up and the time I go to bed. And that will start to disrupt the, the the program. And the pause is the zero. The one is the yang energy. And so in the programming world, in the software world, everything is created by the zeros and the ones. Right now, the ego has the ones, and you don't have the zeros. And so the programming doesn't work very well. So when you can consciously create the zeros and you can consciously create the ones, then you can write your own program. And the ones come from the ability to create space, which is the mother of the other of, of, of all the elements, earth, air, fire, water. Space is the mother. It holds everything. And so when you can consciously create the space by pausing, which is I'm creating a space, you may not. No, there may not be fireworks going on inside your head, but a little spark of light has just gotten brighter in your reality. Wow, a little spark of light has just gotten brighter. You guys, uh, what have we learned today? Just to kind of recap, we've talked about so many things, uh, the mechanics of being a responder versus a reactor, even a nuclear reactor. You can cool that nuclear reactor with the automated uh, cooling system, uh, air-cooled system that uh, we're each engineered and created with. We've talked about mindful speaking and how that can result in salvaging relationships, becoming your own brain mechanic, use some of these techniques. Practice putting some pauses in between your words to cool yep. off that fiery tongue. And you can hear more from Alan by going to his website, um, acamindfulyou.com. That's Alpha Charlie Alpha, A-C-A, mindfulyou.com. And we have one more thing before we let Alan go today. And we're going to go deep under the depths of the deep, dark recesses of the therapy couch. We journey now. We talk ETH. 
as he submerges with our special guest into the depths beneath the dark recesses of the therapy couch. And pull out uh, our question for uh, Alan today. Uh, we're going to spring this on him like we spring it on our other guests. And let me uh, get it up here, and we'll read this and see what Alan has to say. Alan, imagine that um, you're asleep and dreaming. You're having a nightmare. Yes, guys, even folks that practice mindfulness can have uh, difficult dreams sometimes. But it's about communication with someone you care about. But it's a nightmare communication episode, uh, just one of the most difficult instances of communicating with someone you you love and care about you're trying to be a healthy person there um what is uh can you imagine one of the most difficult communication interaction events in your life with someone and how would you tackle it what's the first thing you would do the first thing that i would that i would do would be to get myself since i'm aware of Something just happened in the relationship which hurt somebody, uh, and someone's real upset in front of me, and they're looking at me, and I'm and I'm the reason why they're upset, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, you know, I, yeah, I can see that my behavior did something that caused something to happen inside of you, but until you are able to focus on yourself and get that stable, you'll continue to blame me, and you know, I don't feel totally blameless, but I don't, don't feel I deserve what the energy you put on. And so maybe we need to get each other under physical calmness, stability, breathing first before we engage in any meaningful conversation. Otherwise, it's just the exchange of, ta- of tack thoughts. And if you change the tack thoughts, you're firing and creating destruction, but you're creating destruction in your own reality. So why would you blow up yourself with your attack thoughts but it feels good fabulous uh, i understand it, it, it all start, it really all does start with breathing we have a mug on the uh, therapy bites shop and um it says if you have a hard time shutting someone up try listening to them instead if you have a hard time shutting someone up try listening to them instead and start that listening process out by breathing. Alan, it has been a blast. Thank you so much. That is such important, life-changing information. We'd love to have you back on the show sometime. T-Ballers, thank you for joining us today. Peace to everybody. Go out, practice some mindfulness, engage in some space, uh, take a deep breath, practice that breath regularly. It'll change your life. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for joining. Guest analyst Dr. Jung A. Tart reporting for Art Lab's psychological couch duty for Dr. Freudner on sabbatical being psycho COVID allied. Alan Carroll's PMS performance places him in the 97th percentile on the PMS's MRS, Mindful Responsiveness Scale. This indicates a sad gururifically superlative degree of calming consciousness in Alan's cortical crevices and a tremendous tendency toward tactical tempering and transmogrification. Overall, Master of Mindful Communication Alan Carroll's PMS's psychosilymetric assessment results present a picture of an individual fervently focused on conducting captivating communicative conveyances with a laboriously leaning likelihood of awe-inspiring excellence. This insightfully inspired soul likely has a phenomenally prodigious prognosis of mindful osses in the near future until the transcendental features of his psyche have been psychomologically analyzed and exercised. It is my considered conclusion that our gracious guest Alan Caro be prescribed no less than a 330 milligram IT, intratranscendental dose of space oil azoline and a 2300 milligram SR subrespondent dose of momentoline to enhance communicative cognitions. Dr. Jung Etat, guest shrinkstigator, Therapy Bites Art Lab. Grab some of this episode's guest merchandise, specially designed to help keep this episode's message top of mind in your life. Don't forget friends and family members who could use an Art Lab mental boost too. Just go to Therapy Bites myshopify.com Hey T-Ballers, thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, 
Show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Next time on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Are you struggling to find that secret sauce in your relationship? Do you need some dating advice that's not icky and offensive? Uh, What really works in brand new relationships and what doesn't? We have just the relationship expert the doctor ordered. Uh, literally that is Uh, we rub some keys on the keyboard and a world-class life coach love expert popped out of the electronic bottle of the internet and it is just for you t-ballers today join us coming up next government legal gobbledygook Therapy Bites is not intended as a diagnostic or as an alternative to professional clinical treatment. Resources and advice are for information and entertainment purposes only. Brought to you by... Someone saying things you don't like? Tape that nagging loudmouth shut. Government-approved speech tape. Gas tape. Now available at your local hardware store. Therapy Bites Heart Lab is not, not, not an approved, not, endorsed, not, not. authorized, blood kissing affiliate of the United States Special Offense Assessment Police. So, for short, warning consumption of Therapy Bites Heart Lab content by Kool Aid drinking, stinking, thinking, social media, pseudo psychological pushing, wacky woke, anti free speech, mumbo jumbo advocates may cause spontaneous internal skull combustion, stomach discomfort, and or laxative effects. <laughs> Allergy warning. Therapy Bites is manufactured in a facility that challenges nutty distortions, processes nuggets of accurate, realistic thinking, and life-affirming reliefs. This is the audio version of the legal fine print. Why are you still listening to this when you can catch the next great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab with a good friend or family member? Really? Are you still there? (laughs) This is getting silly. Move on to the next psychologically thrilling episode of the best advice on the net. No copay required. Me eat copay. Yeah, with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball team. Go ahead. Don't be podgorophobic. Scoot, scoot, scoot. On to the next episode. <laughs>